If you watch Space News regularly, you'll probably know that there's a nova that's due to appear somewhere between now and October. If you don't watch Space News closely, this news came out around the same time as the solar eclipse, so it kind of got overshadowed, pun intended. Instead, I look for answers to interesting things that I got curious about when I heard the news. If you already know some of the stuff that's early in the video, feel free to skip ahead because this video gets more geeky as it goes along. So the first thing to understand is that novae aren't super bright events like the occasional supernova is where you can see them in the daytime. This nova should get about as bright as the North Star. Now, I live in a suburb of a fairly light polluted city, so I'm missing a star in the Big Dipper just because of the light pollution, but I can still see the North Star, so be able to see this nova in the sky even if you're in a light polluted area, it as you know where to look. You'll notice that while I've been talking, there's been a video playing of how to find this nova in the sky. If you want more detailed instructions, there's plenty of places you can Google or search on YouTube, so I'm not going to go over it in detail. So what actually is happening at this nova? Nova, if you haven't heard of them before, are binary star systems where one of the stars is either a normal star or a red, red giant, usually the second, and the other star is a white dwarf. Uh, now a white dwarf is a object that's about the size of the Earth with the mass of the Sun packed in there. Um, so very dense and its gravity is strong enough to pull gas off of its companion star, which then accretes in a, in a disk and then falls onto the white dwarf. And I found an interesting scientific paper that explains this and it turns out it's fairly complicated and we have simulations of it but it's not that well understood. It turns out it depends on how fast the hydrogen from the host star is falling onto the white dwarf. If it's falling onto the white dwarf at about the right speed, then hydrogen to helium fusion actually is always happening on the surface of the white dwarf. This actually delays the amount of time that it takes the nova to explode, and in some cases the hydrogen is consumed at about the rate or even faster than it's accreting onto the white dwarf. On the other hand, in some cases, there's a buildup of pure hydrogen that doesn't start fusing until the nova explodes. So that's one of the reasons that this is really exciting for scientists, is that it's a chance to study in more detail what exactly is happening there by looking at the spectra that comes from the white dwarf, etc. Now, most of the brightness from a nova and a supernova and pretty much all objects in that category come from the fact that a significant amount of mass is ejected during the explosion, and then the object in the center is hot enough that it illuminates all the ejecta. So another thing I got curious about is how bright is a nova versus a supernova versus a kilonova? And so I made this chart here based on information that I got um, from various places on the internet. So the bar chart you're looking at is in a logarithmic scale because these things are orders of magnitude larger than each other. The numbers on the left are compared to the luminosity of the sun. So one on the chart is 10 times the luminosity of the sun. Two on the chart is 100 times the luminosity of the sun. And luminosity is defined as the actual brightness if you are at the same distance for every object as opposed to brightness, which is how bright it is in our sky, uh, regardless of our distance from it. So supernova are way, way more bright than novae. There's been quite a few examples over history of supernova that are visible during the daytime. The most famous ones are the one that happened in 1054 AD, and also Kepler's supernova that was in 1604 AD. Now, since Kepler's supernova, there's been no naked eye visible supernova in our sky. Uh, they happen, we think, about every 100 to 200 years in our galaxy. Um, so if you're the type of person who bets on red when the roulette wheel comes up black five times, uh, then we are way overdue. Uh, 
if you're someone who realizes that roulette wheels don't have a memory and it's still a 50-50 chance, then we'll probably have one over the next 100 to 200 years. So the really interesting thing I found doing the research is kilonovas, which are uh, neutron star and neutron star collisions or neutron star black hole collisions, I would have thought would be the most energetic and therefore most luminous of the three types. It turns out that's not true. Kilonova's luminosity is somewhere between nova luminosity and supernova luminosity. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I talked about earlier where most of the light that we see comes from the ejecta and not from the object itself. And so kilonovas probably don't produce as much of an explosion just because of the extremely high gravity. Uh, so they're really interesting in gravity waves and not so bright in the visual spectrum. So the third thing I wanted to talk about is why this is a once in a lifetime event. So if you look at this chart that's on Wikipedia, you can see the list of the 10 recurring nova that we know about. So if you look at the third column, the lower number is the brightest that these objects get. And T. Coronae Borealis gets up to a magnitude of 2.5, which is very visible in the night sky. If you look at the next closest one, it's a magnitude of 4.8, which is pretty clear in a dark sky. In my sky, I don't know that I could see it. Uh, the rest of those are below that. Anything below 6, you need binoculars even in a dark sky. So if you look in the fifth column of T. Coronae Borealis, you can see that there's only four known eruptions, uh, which actually surprised me as well. Uh, there's one in the 13th century, one in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, and we're going to have one in the 21st century. So given that this is the brightest recurring nova that we know about, it happens slightly more often than Halley's Comet visits, but not that much more. So unless you're older than 80 to 90 years, you haven't had a chance in your lifetime to see this before. This is also really interesting because in 1946, we obviously didn't have any telescopes in space. We also didn't have a system in place to notify all the telescopes when something interesting occurs and have them all point at the same spot in the sky in less than a minute. So. As I said before, the amount of science data we're going to get out of this is very significant. So as I and other people have said, this isn't something you're going to go out in the night sky and say, oh my gosh, wow. In fact, you won't notice it unless you're familiar with the stars that are usually in the night sky. But I'm certainly going to go look for it in my sky because the number of astronomical phenomena that are actually visible to the naked eye is pretty low. Where did I get this title from? Guest stars were considered omens in the same way that comets were. Now a guest star could be a nova, it could be a supernova, it could be any naked eye event that looks like a new star which would then disappear. Therefore it's a guest that visits and then leaves. If you like this video please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. It really does help grow the channel and motivate me to keep making more content like this.